I'm David Hamburger, and this is Coffee Talk. Hi, everyone. I'm Kim Perlack. I'm the chair of the guitar department at Berklee College of Music, and welcome to another Coffee Talk. As usual, we are joined by Assistant Chair Cheryl Bailey. Hey, Cheryl. Good morning. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm uh, hydrating. I already did my early morning caffeine <laughs> fanatic trip out, so I'm trying to go I got you. the other side. Balance it out. I got you. Um, that's probably wise. That's a wise choice. <laughs> um, and we're also joined, as usual, by Ben Cody, our senior coordinator. Hey, good morning, Ben. Hey, good morning, Kim. How you doing? Doing good. And and today our special guest is a person who was our special guest here um, not too long ago on campus, David Hamburger. Hey, David. Good morning, everybody. I have my coffee ready to go. Okay, so David, I also see that you are drinking from like a of of an iconic cup, a New York <laughs> iconic cup. I got I got this package in the mail, and for like two or three days, my sister kept texting me from Brooklyn saying, "Did you get it? Did you get it? Did you get it?" And I was really busy. I was like, "Yeah, I got some package." She's like, "Did you open it? Did you open it?" I was like, "No, not yet." She's like, "Why not?" So I finally opened it, and there were four ceramic mugs that are like replicas of the real cardboard thing that I used to drink out of in New York. So I use these all the time. They're my one of my very favorite possessions. If you're listening and you're not watching this, this is a paper cup that has Greek columns on it and it's blue and has this drawing on it. And if you go to New York, this, this is like the cup that you're going to get. That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> So it's pretty great to see that. That's great. David, what do you put in there? What kind of coffee do you have in there? Well, um, so I have a little, one of those little Nespresso machines at the studio. So when I, I really, I know this will be distressing for some of your listeners, but I didn't drink coffee for about 25 years. And I know, right? Crazy. And when I finally did again, it's a long story, but I got to the point where I was like, oh, I want a, I want an espresso machine. And I asked two of my like musician friends who are like the biggest coffee nerds that I knew. And they they were both like, don't buy a real espresso machine. Like it will, you'll just spend all your time getting it repaired. Get one of those instead. So so that's what I did. Um so that but on the but at home I also have um a mocha pot, you know, one of those metal the flange things like you know, it's got like the it's got like, I don't know, eight sides and it's got a bottom that you put the water in and then like a little, you know, metal percolating, like a little cup with the perforations. Looks like an upside down um, uh, funnel. And then, or it looks like a funnel really, but it's kind of got squared edges. And then the top, and it's just a percolator, I guess. You put the water in the bottom and you grind the beans and you put them in the little thingy and then you screw the whole thing together and you put it on the burner and don't turn it up too much or you'll melt it. And then, um, you know, it takes about 10 minutes and it, and, you know, so, so I have that rig at home. And so if you're not in a hurry, that's, that's the way to go. It's really good. How did you get to there? That's a sophisticated leap from nothing. Like, how did you get, you know what I mean? <laughs> okay. So I didn't drink coffee for 24. When I lived in New York, I drank, I drank coffee like a fiend and it made me absolutely bonkers. And so eventually I quit. Um, and then how long ago was this? Seven or eight years ago, I moved into a studio space in Austin that I had that had been there for a long time. It's one of the only the only music house, uh, like music production house for like commercial music in Austin. Um, and uh, they had a I was losing. I had to move out of the space I was in. They had a they had like a their seat room that actually I've worked in like at times as a freelancer, but that room was available. So I moved in there and it was great. It was like a whole thing. And like, they were set up for clients and all that kind of thing. And they had like two or three um, machines there. I guess they were like, you know, with the pods and stuff, it wasn't super fancy, but they had a few of them. And so I just looked at them one morning after I'd moved in and I was like, what's the worst that can happen? And so I just started drinking coffee again. And, uh, and Kate, my wife had been like for years, she had been talking about like, um, well, maybe I'll start drinking coffee again. And I would always just be really sarcastic. Like, yeah. And maybe I'll start shooting heroin. That's a good idea. 
And then we just both sort of got into it. And so now it's like the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You went all the way. Went all the way. Well, I mean, the, the last time I remember drinking coffee a lot was when I went um, to Italy with this folk singer named Jack Hardy. And we were in Italy for two weeks and I drank espresso every day and everything was fine. Like no problem. So I was sort of, I had like fond memories. I was like, oh, I think espresso is okay. I think it's just like, it's like just diner coffee and things like that that do bad things to me. So I think that the, I think the espresso is my thing. Uh, and so um, I don't know, the mocha pot sort of somewhere in between like espresso and like an actual coffee coffee. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I yeah. mean, I really don't feel like I have a leg to stand. I don't really know. I mean, I heard Rich Hinman's episode and he's like very specific about the coffee. And I'm just like, yeah. It's fine. Whatever it is, I'll drink it. It's kind of the same way I pick wine at the store. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Price, yeah. color, price, color, and label design, and I'm good. So, you know. Okay, so the second opening question, after the obvious coffee, yeah, question, um, is is about Berkeley because a lot of people are visiting here, or a lot of people are coming here, and um, and they're getting settled. A lot of the reason that people listen to this show is to, to kind of find their spot here. And um, you grew up nearby Berkeley, but I think the first time you visited was when you were a guest artist here. So could you tell us a little bit about um, like what your impressions were when you were here as a guest and and uh, what are some things that maybe stood out to you about your kind of first days in the guitar department? Oh, I had so much fun. Um... I mean, the work that I do, I do a lot of just sitting here alone in my studio. And I think if you practice a lot also, like you spend a lot of time on your own. And so the best part about it was that like, I spent the whole day just around people, you know, and around other musicians, around other guitar players, and just people that were like, all kind of into talking about music and not feeling like I was just like my own little bubble. Um, you know, and yeah, I did grow up nearby. I grew up in a suburb outside of Boston. I grew up in Lexington. And so being anywhere in Cambridge or Boston was always like really exciting when I was, you know, in junior high or high school. So just walking around, being around, you know, the, the neighborhood that Berkeley's in was super fun, um, you know, and uh, and the people that, showed up for the classes were super motivated like everybody really was you know they wanted to learn about whatever it was we were there to learn about that day you know um so that was that was really fun i mean whatever i mean you know i mean every teacher will always say like that, you know, you're always learning also, right? And so, but the one thing about being a teacher in that environment is like, there's definitely like a loop, you know, there's a there's a similarity between teaching and performing and that you need, like performing is more fun when there's people there and performing is more fun when the people you're performing for are engaged in what you're doing. And the same thing happens when you're teaching. Like if you start to explain something and people have questions and people, are intrigued and they're like, but how does that relate to this? And why are we doing that? Then once you have questions, you know that you're having a conversation and people are interested in what you're trying to explain. And then you feel more motivated to explain more about it um, and to help people figure out the things that they want to know. And you can focus it more too. So everybody, I mean, my experience was that everybody seemed very enthusiastic and very interested in in the things that they had come to learn about. And then like, you know, between classes, I, I walked down the hallway and like, I saw a couple of the same people like doing their ensemble and the ensemble was freaking amazing. I mean, I just sat and watched the entire song and I was like, these guys are great. You know, like it was just really, I was just the, the level of musicianship um, was, was very high. And also, and not like, I mean, having grown up you know, in the Boston area in the 70s and 80s, like I have this impression of what Berkeley is about. Like the people I knew who wanted to go to Berkeley wanted to go to Berkeley either to shred on the guitar or to be able to play bebop, you know, at 470,000 beats per minute. 
that's was my that's you know what I carry around in my head is like that's what a Berkeley student is all about. And these people were playing, you know, like a honky tonk song. And like the guitar player was like just super tasteful and playing this great chicken picking stuff. And there was a steel guitar player. I learned to play steel in the in New York in the 90s. And I had no idea that anybody at Berkeley even knew what the steel guitar was. So again, like it's clearly like there's a lot more to what's going on at Berkeley than I ever had any notion of when I was at NATO and I would have gone there. <laughs> I think that that's one thing that comes up a lot for us because I think for a while, like places grow and change. Right. And so that probably was quite accurate back then. You know, I remember visiting Berkeley in the nineties and like early nineties and you could walk down the row of practice rooms and it would just be like little rooms of shredders. Yeah. Like shredders or, or rock shredders all the way down the line. Yeah. And uh, this is definitely true because um, both you and Cheryl and I taught at National Guitar Workshop and all the rock students would go like kind of from the workshop to Berkeley. You know, you could kind of walk down and, and it was kind of like the NGW summer camp dorm was now the 150 dorm kind of for a while. And then I think more and more throughout the 90s and the early 2000s and then definitely in the 11 years that I've been here, um, all the other styles have come in. So I feel like we're at a real pretty equal footing. I mean, sometimes you have more rock players or more jazz players, but now you've got country players and blues players and funk players and classical players. And everybody's at a very high level. It's not like, you know, we, the, there's some one style where everybody's great. And then, and then the others are kind of all the not so great that I think the whole level has, has gone up very consistently so i think that's cool to hear that you noticed that that's really great that's yeah really great. i mean i i my i don't know this because i'm not there and i'm not like around enough other people in other educational institutions but my impression is is that a lot more people in education take a lot more styles seriously i mean when even when i was going to graduate school the one semester that i made it through when i was in graduate school in the when would that be the late 80s you could basically study classical music or you could study jazz. There was nothing else to study. And you couldn't even get it. One of the reasons I dropped out was that part of why I was in graduate school was so that I would have like qualifications to teach. It was like mm -hmm. the only time my parents ever were like, maybe you should study a little more so that you can da 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 da, you know? And so I was talking to one of my professors and I was like, well, you know, what do I need in order to teach? And they were like, well, you need a PhD really. And I was like, well, that's great. Like, can I get a PhD here? And they were like, oh, not in jazz, no. I was like, does anybody do a PhD in jazz? They were like, no. And I was like, let me get this straight. Like, <laughs> what exactly is going on? I mean, now you can get a doctorate in jazz studies, I'm pretty sure, at least in a few places. But the idea that you could, I mean, I was at Manhattan School of Music, and the idea that they didn't even want me, like, I had a professor who was giving the, giving us these assignments where we were doing like we had to do a paper and we had to do a presentation and we had to do like one other research project and by the second research project i came in and i was like i don't know who i wanted to talk about charlie christian or grant green or somebody and he said well you already did you already you already talked about guitar players in your last paper isn't that a lot of guitar players and i was like what about the dude who wanted to do like bill evans and red garland and Whitney kelly like was that too many piano players like what the heck you know so like they didn't even really want any guitar stuff you know it's like so i mean the idea that you could go somewhere and study like blues guitar or songwriting or production or any of these things that like happened after 1959 or 1963 is fantastic you know i'm like hooray so i think it's i think it's cool yeah it is i mean i think we're still the biggest we're still the most diverse you know i think uh, a lot when we visit other places and and you know check out what other people are doing and get some ideas from them and share some ideas. We still have, you know, some places now have a commercial music department, um, but sometimes that's code for not classical. Right. As opposed to going really deep into a style. And there, I think there's still some myths that other styles of music um, that aren't uh, classical or jazz um, that don't have, I think one of the phrases I learned from you at one point was like the Mount Everest mentality. Like if it's complex or challenging to play, then it must be better. I said, and there's a little bit of a, 
in other places. I think you did. I think I quoted you in my dissertation saying that. Oh, maybe so. I remember talking about that. Yeah, that was very good. And, uh, but like that idea that if something doesn't look complex in a certain way, then it's not deep or it's not hard to play. And that we know that's not true. You know, we just know that's not true. We just know that um, when you're working in in popular styles or roots music styles, or you know that there's such a sophistication and a and a technical and musical depth required to play tastefully, even if it doesn't have some of the the qualities of what virtuoso means in other styles. Um, right. Yeah. So I, I mean, in Western music, we have this emphasis on linearity, right? And I mean, the classic comparison is like, you know, like, so we have someone like Beethoven, who's like the heights of harmonic complexity, but then you compare that to like the rhythmic complexity of West African music. And you're like, sorry, Beethoven, like, you know, it's like this, this other things, it's like a different set of values that's been developed just as much, but in a different way. And I mean, you know, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I run into this all the time like, especially when I was teaching blues guitar at the at the National Guitar Workshop, like someone would come in on the first day and I would start with some things that I thought were kind of important about, you know, phrasing or, you know, the structure of a solo. But I was using really simple elements to demonstrate it because I was like, you know, I want you to focus on this bigger picture here of like how we're putting these things together. And there'd always be some guy who'd be like, well, I already know how to do this. I'm out of here. I'm like, yeah, you know how to play the scales, but you don't know how to do anything good with them. You know, you just know how to go, wee -wee -wee -wee, you know, and it's not like anything really, you know, is going on. I mean, I get it because, you know, if you look at some of these things, like certain kinds of blues or certain kinds of, you know, honky tonk or the other things, you know, like if you're a, if you're a guitar player who has been working through like the Ted Green book or you're like, really obsessed with like your chord vocabulary and you're trying to like play voicings all over the neck. And then you go see Del McCurry and he uses the same six chords, the entire concert. Then you go, this guy doesn't know any chords. It's like, no, he doesn't need to know any more chords. Cause those are the chords that like, he can like do everything else on top of that needs to be done. He can interact. If he started playing like altered chords up the neck, it would completely screw up the music. You wouldn't be able to get the drive that you need out of the, like, there's so many things that he's doing with those chords, like the way that he plays them, the volume he can get out of an acoustic instrument, the pulse, the way that he's like, you know, communicating with the rest of the band, the things that he has to be able to feel solid about so that he can do that phenomenal singing on top of it. It's like, there's so many things going on that like, that is the best choice. And so it's just, yeah, it, it makes me nuts when people are like, well, he doesn't know any chords. Like, no, he doesn't need to know any more chords. He knows those chords. And I challenge that like hypothetical straw man that I've created over there with the chords, like to make those G chords sound half as good as Don McCurry. You know, it's not, you know, it's like, that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. I also would say that he probably doesn't only know those chords because that's the other argument that I think we're fighting all the time. Well, I only need, I don't need to know more. Oh, that's and I think true. like what you choose, it's like there's a difference between really knowing your instrument and knowing its depth and complexity and then making choices, right? And then playing those choices well, because I think those come arguments come from both sides. Like people who play more complex styles will say, oh, you know, the people who play popular music only know three chords. They only need to know three chords. Well, they don't just know three chords. You you couldn't get to the bottom sometimes of, of what people know but you might hear them play very simply simple things it, very beautifully and very tastefully because they're making choices. And then when we have students who say, well, why do I need to know all this stuff in the final exam materials or the proficiencies, like we call them, because I'm only going to use these three chords. Like, well, maybe you want more options and maybe these other things will show you, show you what you can pick. And so I think there's all these things. It's like, that we're trying when you when you look at musical values of styles it doesn't necessarily coincide to this idea of what weight is you know what i mean that yeah that people are looking at from the surface level you know and i think that's important what you're saying yeah well one of the, one of the things that we that i talked to because when I, I taught us uh i taught a slide class an electric slide class and 
um, I asked everybody, you know, why, why, why did you sign up for this class in the first place? And a, a few of them said, well, they wanted to be studio musicians. And so they wanted to have as many different tools as possible. Um, <clears throat> and we got into this conversation about like, there's really, I think there's really two ways to go about getting, you know, educating yourself or preparing yourself if you want to be a working musician. And <clears throat> one is, I think of as the art the artist route and the other is the artisan route. So if you're going to be an artist, you are only responsible for being able to do the thing you're setting out to do. If you want to like, you know, as a as an acquaintance of mine once said, if you want to like write the songs, wear the hat and play the show, like there's that path, right? Which is like you do you. And like it is in that situation, you can afford on some level to say, all I need is what I need to do this. Like if that's the path that you're committed to. Now it's true that you still should be over-prepared and able to do more than just the immediate things in front of you. You should write a hundred songs so that you have 10 good ones. You should, you know, whatever, all that stuff, right? And and a lot of the stuff you're saying too about like, you don't just need what you need. You need a lot of options, but that's different from the artisan route, which is saying, whatever comes my way, I'm going to be able to help someone execute what they're trying to do. And that does mean, you know, as many styles as possible, as many, you know, maybe different instruments, different fluencies and tones and all these different things. And there's obviously like some overlap in that Venn diagram, you know, like you, you like there are people who like are capable of, you know, serving other people's musical vision and yet still have something they can do on their own. And there are people who can make their own thing, but they're perfectly capable of you know, going elsewhere. And like, you know, like a guy like um, Brad Paisley is a good example. Like that guy can write and sing and perform and lead a band and run the business that is being Brad Paisley. But he's a ferocious musician and he could go and be like an A-list sideman on a session in Nashville any day or probably any kind of session, you know. But he's made this choice that like his focus is around being an artist. Whereas someone like, you know, our friend Pat Bergeson, like could go out and play shows as Pat Bergeson but he basically chose to be like, you know, a, a human Swiss army knife on some level. Like he can, you know, you could put him anywhere and he can just play the living daylights out of what's required, you know? And, you know, that's like more of a, almost like a, it's partly a career choice and it's partly a temperament that just kind of, you get the temperament you get, you know? But I mean, I feel like, in the arc of what I've done, I've spent a lot of time trying to be the Swiss Army knife. And had, but over the last maybe, I don't know, five to 10 years, like I've just been like throwing stuff overboard left and right. And I'm just like, eh, I think I'm just going to do this, you know? Mm -hmm. But to get there, like, I mean, especially if you're like 18, 19, 20 and you're studying, it's like, you know, that's kind of when you want to like just soak everything up. I mean, there are records I wish I had found sooner because I would have had the time and appetite to learn them inside out but if i didn't find those records by the time i was in my mid-20s like i know them i like them i can get in there and learn from them if i need to but i haven't like swallowed them whole like you do when you're you know a little bit younger i think you know i mean like when i found out who charlie christian was i was already out of college but i sat down and memorized every solo on the lp that i had because i was like this is something i need to know but, you know, now if I came across a guitar player like that, that I hadn't somehow come across before, I'm not going to sit around and learn a whole record by somebody at this point. I'm going to go partly because you're more efficient the older you get. And you're like, oh, I think I see this is the essence of that that I need. But, you know, I, I don't know. Um, you learn a lot from soaking up as much as possible. And then you can kind of filter out what it is you need, I think. So there are a couple of things I want to go to that you just said, and I want to start almost with the second one that I thought of, which is that thing that you talked about, about like swallowing things up and really taking charge of your own education. Because we have students here in this amazing music school, they have tons of resources like from the guitar department, but there's this element that you're touching on that I think was more common for maybe previous generations because access wasn't so easy for things like we just had, it seems to us and I've got, it could be like, 
you know, I walked 10 miles in the snow kind of thing, like because we're older and you look at it differently. So I don't know, Ben's laughing because he's younger than us here. So it could be that. And I, I leave room for that. It does seem though that um, one of the things the faculty are saying is they're trying to encourage students to do that kind of work you're talking about, where you take charge and you say like, here's the music that I'm interested in and I'm going to listen to the recordings I like and then follow them back historically and then really work with the record and absorb that record. And um, could you just share what you mean specifically about how you did that? Because I know you did that. I know that you you really got into these records and it wasn't just like you listened to them and you liked them. It was that you learned what was on them. Well, part of it, like so the my my version of the 10 miles through the snow is that there was almost nowhere to get information in print or even from a teacher about the kind of music I wanted to learn. So, you know, my high school guitar teacher who had actually been to Berkeley as a composition student, a guy named Jeff Wyman, mm -hmm. uh, who was a huge influence on me and just a fantastic human being and musician. But he when I got interested in finger style guitar, he said, oh, well, here's this tune, Angie, you should learn. It was on a, you know, it was written by Davy Graham in, in England in the early 60s, but it was recorded on a Simon and Garfunkel record, this, this instrumental guitar piece. So I learned what he knew of that tune. And then I said, great, what else have you got? He was like, that's the only thing like that I know. I was like, oh, you're kidding me. So I went to <laughs> the Strawberries record store at the mall to like, you know, and there's like one bin this thick of folk music looking for mm -hmm. Simon and Garfunkel. And because like the one thing you could read was Guitar Player magazine. And I had read a guitar player about these two guys, Stefan Grossman and John Renborn, and they had a duet record. So I bought that instead of buying Simon and Garfunkel. Best decision I ever made because in a record store, because that was all instrumental guitar, right? And, and Stefan Grossman had a column in Guitar Player where he was writing out arrangements and some of them were from that record. And it turns out John Renborn was like a direct disciple of Davy Graham, who had written Angie. He was like a guy in the early 60s in England who was like, oh, Davy Graham, like opened the door for everybody to do this thing that was like, we weren't really American. So we were learning from American blues records, but Davy Graham showed that you could like combine that with like Celtic music or Middle Eastern music or British folk music or whatever. So those two guys, that the summer I got that album, I just listened to it like, you know, every day before I went to work and just like, and then I was trying to learn, like if Stefan Grossman had written it out in Guitar Player, I would just like look at that. That was like the only tab that I had. And then for the rest of it, I would just try to figure it out off of records or like I got a Dave Van Ronk record from the library, this record called Sunday Street. And it was a solo vocal and guitar record. And I couldn't find, I knew you were supposed to listen to like, the pre-war blues guys, if you like blues, like I knew their names again from like reading about them in guitar player. I knew about Robert Johnson or Gary Davis because everybody that was in the, in the magazine who liked that kind of music talked about those people, but I couldn't find the records. So what I, whatever I could find at the library or the record store, or eventually like, you know, I would go to Harvard square and go to use record stores. Cause there used to be like a million of them. Um, you know, whatever I could find albums of, that's what I would learn. And so I found Dave Van Ronk. And so like, I would sit and learn, like trans, like just try to figure out what he was doing. And, you know, it's a solo guitar record. So you have a fighting chance, but then maybe it's in an open tuning or maybe someone's playing slide guitar or, you know, maybe there, you know, maybe there is a second guitar on there and it's like, well, it sounds like two guys, but I know this is like supposed to be one guy, you know, it's like all that stuff. Um, so I don't know if that really answers your question, but like, it was basically like, if you wanted stuff like that, you had to figure out how to learn it, you know, because right. there wasn't really anybody. I mean, I learned to play slide guitar from a person. Like I owned a slide and I knew that slide was part of playing blues, but then I went to college and there was a senior my freshman year who actually knew how to play slide. And he would sit, he was the monitor in the, his name was Stedman Hinckley. And he would sit in the, music building and check people in like to who would coming in at night for like their lessons and would go practice. So I was taking classical guitar lessons. I was, I swear, I am quite confident. I was hands down the worst classical guitar student in the history of the guitar, but I would go to these guitar lessons every Thursday night. 
And then afterwards, I would come downstairs and I would sit and play slide guitar with this guy Stedman for like three hours. And so I would just learn by like, because that's hard. Like, it's like a touch thing and it's like a tuning thing. And so like, you know, I would just, like, he would be like, well, it goes like this. And I would just watch him and like, you know, learn how to play. So, I mean, I did a lot of that kind of stuff just because, and even when you could find books, like, it's not the same. Like, it's really hard to learn like, folk music or fingerstyle blues out of a book because you don't know what it's supposed to sound like because like half the time like there there would be like a book that's like well here's here's elizabeth cotton and here's john hurt and here's so and so and you look at this tab and you're like i don't know what this is supposed to sound like i never heard these people you know um so unless it was like sort of married together then it was really hard to you know like there were records over here and there was tab over here and like trying to like you know it was like trying to mix like, you know, I don't know, like, you know, uh, Lego and Fisher Technic and like trying to get them to work together, you know, and they don't. It's like you got to try to. So anyway. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that's one of the things that we're working with now is when you do have resources at your fingertips or you have a school like this where literally you could walk down the hallway and you could just pick a door and it would be the best person available who yeah. wants to teach in that style that you picked. How do you also kind of harness that sort of drive that you get when you have to look for something? You know yeah. what I mean? How do you like combine those things? Like, cause, cause a lot, you know, a lot of people growing up will say like, Oh, if I only had access and then you have, okay, great. Here's full access. And it's like, Oh, okay. Well then maybe I'll do it tomorrow. You know what I mean? So yeah. Yeah. Fact, we would love to, to find out the key, how to turn that key for everybody so that you keep the drive and you keep the passion and you keep the interest, the thing that would make you sit for three hours and work on something um, in a healthy way, by the way, so that you don't get injured. And then, <laughs> right. And then also take advantage of the access because every score is a map, right? You have to learn notation. You probably know tab. Um, and then you have to, like every style has authenticities of how you play it. Yeah, and so you yeah. have to listen and you have to listen to different people and you have to kind of match the technique with the, with, you know, the way you're playing something and what you're playing matter just as much. Right. And yeah. so all of that is part of this oral tradition. We just took the oral tradition and stuck it in a school, yeah. but because we did that, sometimes people think, oh, well, it's just here and I can take it or leave it as opposed to like, oh my gosh, I get four years to immerse myself in the oral tradition that happens to live in this place where by the way i also get to have a dorm room and food you know yeah. what i mean so i just like like we've created what we dreamt and now everyone's like oh okay well maybe tomorrow oh i'll let you know you know what i mean all of that i don't know if you remember there was this studio bass player who came to the workshop i cannot remember his name he was like one of the heaviest guys from like the 80s and 90s and he played like some enormous six-string electric bass and and just talked about like his sound and all this stuff. But when the Q&A came and someone said like, what advice would you give to like a high school student like learning to play? He was like, get your parents to buy as much gear as possible before you move out of the house because you won't be able to afford it later. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it's kind of like, you know, like you're right. Like they have four years at this institution. And I mean, just for an example, like, you know, a couple of the people that came to the finger picking class I taught were like, well, we're kind of interested in like Merle Travis and Chet Atkins. I was like, you know, Guy Van Duzer is right down the hall. He knows more about that than Chet Atkins. You know, I mean, he, he does. He used to prank Chet. Did I tell you this story? You did. You have to tell everyone, though. This is Van a Duzer great story. In, in the later years of Chet's life, Guy Van Duzer, who had grown up learning to play from Chet Atkins records and was also like, it, guy is like just brilliant in the studio too like he's been a recording musician forever and ever he used to prank chet by finding songs chet hadn't recorded in the 50s and then recording them exactly in the style with the same sounds and instruments and everything that chet had used in the 50s and then he would send him the recordings he would send them to nashville and be like chet remember doing this one to see if chet would be like oh god yeah i kind of did i do that one yeah i kind of you know like he's that good. Like he knows Chet that well. Besides having like, I mean, I would put Guy up there as like in my pantheon of like as one of like the four or five people that like I think sounds 
more like himself than anybody on the guitar. Like, you know, he's like one of my absolute role models. Like, that's what it sounds like to do your own thing and do it like, you know, to the nth degree, you know. But as far as like having resources, I think this is, <sighs> there's two things. One is that having as many resources as we all have now does mean you feel like there's no rush. Like any day you want to, you can go on YouTube and you can watch John Hurt any day you want to for as long as you want. That makes my 13 year old head explode because if I got to get, if I got to see someone good, I got to see them live once and then they were gone. Or if I could get like a good guitar player in my high school to sit down and show me something, they would show me one thing. And I'd be like, Oh, well, what can I do with this? And so like, I think there's actually a disadvantage to having, I mean, it's not like it's a disadvantage to have all the information in the world, but this is, this story is the opposite of that, which is, I don't know if you remember when Tal Farlow came to the guitar workshop. Yes, I was there. I was there. I was in yep. the cafeteria when he, first of all, let us pause for a moment to talk about the ineptitude of a system which expects Tal Farlow to eat in the cafeteria. Like it took them like 10 years to realize we should take the guest artist out for dinner so here comes Tal Farlow with his tray, with his spaghetti and meatballs and his jello or whatever it is we were, they were serving. And he's just kind of standing there looking around. And I'm like, oh my God. And I, I don't know if he, I was sitting by myself where I went over. I was like, do you need a place to sit? And so I sat and had dinner with Tal Farlow by myself. It was like one mm -hmm. of the, it was like the best hour I ever spent at the workshop because I loved Tal Farlow's music. And he told me, and I said, look, I know you, I mean, it was probably hell for him because all I wanted to do was talk to him about music. And he probably just was like, I'm going to be talking about music all afternoon and all night. Can I just eat my meatballs in peace? But we talked about music and I said, you know, I read that you learned to play from Charlie Christian records. Like, how did that work? And he was like, well, every six weeks there would be a new Benny Goodman 78 and there would be one song on each side. And maybe one of those songs would have a Charlie Christian solo and maybe the solo would be eight bars long. So for six weeks, I would learn that solo and then I would try to figure out everything else, note this part, everything else I could do with that solo until the next record came out. That's how he learned is by not just like learning the solo, but like the solo was so valuable that he took it apart and put it back together every which way to go, well, does it work here? Does it work there? Can I play it in this key? Can I, I mean, I don't know how he did it, but this is what I imagined happened. Because if you only had that much material, you'd have to like tear it apart and try to generalize. And by the time the next record comes out, you're like, oh, now he's using that to do this. And that's something you don't get if you were given the job of transcribing. I mean, oh my God. Like, I mean, I remember sitting down when my, my roommate in college, here I'll sound really old now. My roommate in college got, got a, a real, had a reel to reel tape recorder that had two speeds. So I would, go to him and say, can you take this Joe Passel and record it at, I don't know, whatever, it was 30 inches per second. And then can you play it back onto a cassette at 15? Basically, I didn't have like a turntable that went like to whatever it is. I guess, I guess like Charlie Parker and people like that used to slow down, you know, Johnny Hodges or whoever by going from 33 to 16 RPM. This was the same thing. Like I got, a, eventually ended up with a cassette of Joe Pass playing half as fast and octave down. And I transcribed all five choruses of the solo. And I don't remember a single note now, you know, because it was too much information. But when I transcribed Charlie Christian, I only had eight bars, just like Tal Farlow did. And I made myself memorize each eight bar solo and then move on to the next one. And then at the end, once I had it memorized, then I would write it out just in case I forgot. But I made myself memorize it to the record because I knew if I just wrote it down, it would come in my head and go out my fingers and I wouldn't get anything in my body. You know, it would just be gone, you know. And when I when I get blues guitar students who want to learn to play swing or, you know, play jazzy on the blues, you know, they want to be able to play like, they don't really want to play bebop, which is good because I don't know how, but they want to be able to play, you know, they're like, what is Kenny Burrell doing on the blues? Or what is T-Bone Walker? Or what are one of those guys doing? I'm like, well, let's not learn like 8,000 choruses of T-Bone Walker or Charlie Christian. Like, let's, like, what is he doing when he gets to the four chord? Like, what are three things that he does on the four chord? What are three things that he does on the turnaround? 
Like if you can learn those three things, then you have three choices. And if you can divide the blues up into six two bar sections and you have three things for each one, then it's just a math problem. Like what's, you know, three times three times three times three times three times three. Now you have like, I don't know, 120 something ways to play through it. And that's more useful and more mobile. And that's how people learn simpler quote unquote styles. You learn blues or rock guitar one lick at a time because you get something off a record or someone says, this is cool. But then when you go to learn jazz, you think like you got to swallow it whole somehow. And you can just, I mean, I know that this is not, I mean, I have this running argument with our mutual friend, Brett Boyer about like how you learn jazz, you know? And I'm just like, learn a bunch of licks, you know? And he's like, well, I want to learn in a more like general. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Like, but I mean, for someone trying to make the bridge from blues to jazz, I'm like, you know, you listen to Charlie Christian, he's playing licks, he's playing shapes. You can see the shapes go by on the guitar. That was, I've gone way off the, off the, no, but this is good because I think what happens sometimes, and this is something that you all can try if you're listening and you're a guitar player, is that we often as teachers will give you material. Like we did a bunch of really cool chord voicings in my ensemble the other day that are like three note chords, but they're not tertiary. They're they're built in seconds and fourths and fifths and seconds, right? So then they they're very useful. They can be a myriad of different things. And they sound really beautiful, right? And then I think what what we kind of expect sometimes is like, well, you know, if I had them in my style, this is what I would do with them. So you're going to learn them and then you're going to take them home and figure out what you would do with them and then come back with the cool thing and then we'll work on that thing. But sometimes I think when we say that, it's almost like that game that kids play where, you know, you where you have a baseball bat and you put your head on it and you spin around really fast. And then like they go out into the world after having spun around with new material and then they just bang into the wall. You know what I mean? Like, like it's like, it's really hard for people who haven't had to be systemic with a small amount of information because there was no other information to actually come up with three things. So one thing you could do is do exactly what David just said and just say like, here's some information, whether it's an eight bar solo or it's chord voicings or like, you know, if you don't know where to start, you could open up the Berkeley guitar theory book and like, here's something that I'm working on. What are three things I can do with it? Hmm. Like listen to a recording and say, well, like, what are three things this person's doing that I could learn and then do something else with, like write something with, take a solo with, make the chords, put them in a different progression, put them in a different order. See, put a different bass note underneath, like make a list of things and do those things until they sound really great. And then you have stuff to build on as opposed to like thinking that things like, sure, there are things that are lick based, but if all you do is learn one lick from someone and then you just play that lick and it sounds great and that's all you do with it, you don't have anything for you now. You just have that thing you took off that record. So um, there's this gap sometimes because I think there's a lot of information out there and there's a lot of easy access of like you you kind of take something, but then you have to do things with it and you have to practice those things systemically before you know that they might be successful. And I think people want the proof first. Like if I put in time, like, is mm -hmm. there proof? Like, will it be a, will it be cool? And if, if you can't convince them, then they won't put in the time. But then if you don't put in the time, you won't get anything cool. So it's it's yeah. kind of a hard sell. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm realizing I kind of left out a couple of steps in my description because um, what I would do once I learned the couple of specific things is then try to make up exercises and general things to do with them, you know, like when I was learning to play bluegrass dobro, again, not a lot of information. And uh, so there was one book written by Stacy Phillips. And I went through that as much of that book as I could in like 10 months, because I knew he was going to be coming to the, the workshop to teach. And I crashed his class because we had a week off between the teaching that I had to do and you had to do whatever. And he taught all this different crazy stuff that he was into. Like he was into using the dobro to play like Balkan music or whatever, you know, Hawaiian music, all these, I mean, Hawaiian music makes sense. Cause like, you know, he was interested, he was interested in using it as an instrument, not as a genre thing, like not as I will now play bluegrass and honky tonk on this instrument, which is amazing. But I was 23 and 
wanted to know how to play bluegrass. So at the end of the week, you know, the last day, everybody's kind of done. And he's like, any questions? I was like, yeah, can you show us how to play bluegrass? <laughs> and he just kind of like rolled his eyes and was like, okay, gather around children. And he spent like 10 minutes going, okay, well, like, you know, you can play an open position here and this is the basic scale and this is the blue scale. And then like, you know, Uncle Josh would go up to the fifth fret here and when he was playing with Fat and Scruggs and then over here is where you get the five and da 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 make sure you do this and make sure you do that. Okay, we're done. It's like, fantastic. That's the 10 minutes I needed. And I went home and I spent two years working on those 10 minutes because he had showed me the scale. He had showed me the technique, like the pull-offs and hammer-ons. He had showed me where to go to play the changes but then I had to figure out a way to like generalize that and had to, because there was, that wasn't in his book. And I had to basically like make up my own way to break that into little pieces and put it back together again. And I was able to do that because one of my teachers at college, Bill Barron, who was a saxophone player, had taught us how to practice. And I didn't really learn anything idiomatic from him because he was so focused on like just knowing your instrument, you know? So it's like, here's how you run scales. Here's how you run arpeggios. Here's how you play through a John Coltrane tune. These are one, two, three, five patterns and none of that. You know, we never transcribe. I mean, he never asked us. He's just probably just assumed we were transcribing and we weren't because we were dumb, but you know, he never said like, here's how to play a blues like Lester Young. He just said like, here's what you need to know to know your instrument. And we were like, okay. And but he had taught us how to practice. And so when I wanted to play bluegrass dobra, I was like, well, this will be funny. I'll use this jazz saxophone thing to play the bluegrass tobro. And ha ha ha, that's a great trick, you know? But like, you have to figure, you do kind of have to figure out how to teach yourself. And I think good teaching in an institution or a private teacher or whatever is explaining to someone, this is how you learn. This is how you learn how to work on stuff because after those four years, you're going to have to learn it on your own. Like you can keep studying with people and you can keep going places and digesting stuff. But on some level, if you want to be good, you have to learn how to teach yourself because you have to learn how to get it into your brain in a way that's systematic. You have to know how to retrieve it. You know, have to know how to look at a thing you don't know how to do and go, how did I get from the, how did I figure out the last thing? What do I need to apply to figure out this thing? You know, I mean, if I knew about learning what I know, if I, if I, if I knew what I know about learning now, when I was in college, I might've actually been able to learn how to play jazz, but I didn't know how to learn yet. You know, I was completely oblivious. So, you know, I didn't really learn how to learn stuff until I started trying to teach myself stuff in my twenties. And then everything I had learned before from any kind of teacher, like writing teacher, music teacher, whatever, then all that stuff kind of came into play. And I was like, oh, well, there's no one here to show me how to play the pedal steel. Because there just isn't. So I'm going to have to extrapolate. You know, I think this is a really good segue to the other thing I wanted you to talk about a little bit, as much as you'd like, which is the, the thing you said about being an artist or an artisan, right? And I think you are a person who's both in the sense that you have a very, very distinctive personal sound. Like when people say your name, they know they can conjure up what it sounds like. Um, you found a way to play like a root style, a like finger style blues. And it really sounds like you, And but it also pulls in a bunch of different things, different styles, depending on what song you're playing. But then you've also had this career that you built where you've been a freelancer and you've been a side person and you've been a solo artist and you're a songwriter and you've been a composer, you've done films, um, you've also done studio work and um, you've toured with other people and you've been a teacher. You do a lot for True Fire now and and like a lot of workshops and master classes and private lessons and stuff like that. And, and over the course of your life, you've sort of, I think you've been one of the more courageous people I've known about saying like, I'm going to do this now, or I'm going to do this now, or I'm going to stop doing this. And so at some level, like the way that you learned to teach yourself allowed you to develop like what you wanted to do artistically, what you found super interesting, but also apply it to a whole bunch of different contexts. And then just say over the course of your professional life, like, okay, I believe I can make money doing this now because I want this kind of life. Like I want to go to a studio and I want to write and I want to record, or I want to be on tour, or I want to be playing other people's music, or I want to do my music. And I want to live in Austin, Texas, you know, like, can you talk a little bit about how you put that together or, you know, and or how you think about that in your life? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing is I remember standing like outside the music store with that guitar teacher, Jeff Wyman, when I was heading off to college and thinking, well, whatever happens, I don't want to end up a guitar teacher. <laughs> anything but that but at the same time i was like i don't you know I, I it only took like a year of like doing real like having a real job to know that like i never wanted to do that again like i would do anything as long as it involved music because i hated feeling like i was guessing and when i worked in new york at like you know at like a financial institution or something like doing legal doing like you know editing or proofreading i was like i don't know what i'm doing i'm just guessing this sucks i want to do something where i know what i'm talking about so i was like basically my main mission was like i'll do it if it involves music and that includes teaching and that includes a lot of things um but at the same time the first 30 years were basically, or, or up until I moved to Austin. So my the 14 years I was in New York, I wanted to, on some level, I wanted to be an artist. Like I wanted to just like write songs, sing, perform, do my thing. But I didn't actually think I could pull it off. Like I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't think I was a good enough singer for one thing. And I just, you know, I certainly didn't feel like it was, it's notoriously like the least lucrative thing you can do unless you are one of the 0.0001% that, you know, are Beyonce or whoever. Um, and so I did all these other things. I looked at them as kind of like, um, I was like, well, you got to have work. And so I just, well, I, I went up to the workshop to teach the first summer. I taught for three weeks and I met all these guys and they were mostly guys who were, teaching guitar in the tri-state area. And I was like, oh, I think I could do that. So that was the first thing of like, sure, I could teach guitar, you know? And then a couple of years into teaching at the workshop, they were like, well, we need people to write some books. And I was like, sure, I could probably write a book. How hard could that be? You know, because I like explaining things and I don't mind telling people what to do. So, um, you know, and each time you do something, and, th and then, you know, I went, the workshop had like they they co-sponsored an event in New York City with Guitar Player Magazine. And I remember that uh Joe Gore was there. He was the editor of Guitar Player at the time. And he was doing a I was he was doing a panel on guitar teaching. And I was like, this guy is like the editor of Guitar Player. And he's like toured and done all these things. Like, why is he talking about teaching? Well, because he used to teach 80 students a week. And I was like, even that guy? You know, because I walked around, you know, for years just thinking like everybody else like had it totally together and was just like only doing the thing I saw them do. When it turns out tons of people are doing like when I met Guy Van Duzer, I was like, well, you know, did you and Billy ever just tour as like Guy and Billy, like as a touring act? Because to me, they had records out and they played concerts. And I thought like that's all they did. And Guy was like, yeah, we did it once for two weeks in California. And we both hated it. And we never did it again. I was like, well, what do you mean? And it turns out like he had this job making music for Disney for like 25 years. And I was like, so you're not Guy Van Duzer, guitar player, 24 hours a day? You know, I mean, like like a kid, like just like not understanding that like people need to like have a job and do something, you know? And um, so, you know, um, I just, you know, I, I thought I was the only one who was actually kind of trying to figure out this way to game the system and have a way to make money with music that wasn't, you know, being a rock star, you know? Um, and luckily I never wanted, like once I figured out that I was not going to get to be George Harrison, I lost all interest in being a rock star per se. I was like, I just want to play, like the guys that I like are, you know, you can go see them in a 200 seat place. And, you know, that's all I want to do is like play like them, whether it's Mike Aldridge or Dave Van Ronk or, you know, David Grisman or like people like that were my, were my ideal as far as being a performer. So my standards were really low as far as like a commercial point of view goes but to me those people were like they were the superstars that's who i wanted to to be so i'm not really answering the question but like it was sort of a series of of looking at things and going i think i could probably do that you know like when i i went to the, with friends to see nancy griffith the texas songwriter and she had this guy with her who was playing dobro and pedal steel and accordion and fiddle he was like a utility guy and his name was, was fats kaplan and i thought 
I play slide guitar and I've always, I, I think I could probably learn to play the dobro. And if, if obviously, obviously you need to do both. Like you need to play the dobro and the steel. That's what's cool. It's like to be able to play both. I think I could probably learn to do that. And it obviously takes a really long time, but I, you know, just, and once I was doing that, I was like, oh, I think I could probably play with other people doing that. So it was just a series of, of, you know, moments of just thinking like, that looks doable. Eh, somebody and and all along the way, my mantra was always like, whenever anybody asked me in my twenties, like, what do you mean, like you're a, you want to like be a professional musician? I was like, well, someone's doing it. Like someone's getting paid to do. Like someone's making a living as a musician. Like it might as well be me. Like someone's doing it. You know. And if you don't, if you don't have to be a rock star, if you, if you're if doing what you do as a musician and getting paid for it doesn't involve being on a huge stage with a costume and smoke machines and like 50,000 guitars, if that's not the only way you can be satisfied with a career, then there are a million things you can do. Like there are a gazillion things and they it always changes. Like when I started doing ad music, I was kind of catching to me like the tail end of a period when it was actually like a pretty lucrative and pretty satisfying gig. And over the course of the 10 years I did it, it kind of became a less and less at least, I don't know if it was just for me or it just sort of looked in general, like things were kind of going like this because people were licensing more music. Everything was available as an MP3, like commercial music got less valuable during the time that I was doing it to the point where I was like, well, this was really fun when I started and really exciting, but it's kind of gotten less fun and less lucrative. And maybe it's just me and I'm okay with that too. It's probably had something to do with the fact that I was twice as old as the typical person at an agency who was trying to find music and was asking me to like write music like people I'd never heard of. And for a while that was fun to go, oh, I'd never heard of them. Let me see what this is about. And when it stopped being fun, I was like, you know, I should probably teach because that's what I'm really way better at than trying to pretend that I understand how hip hop works or whatever it was that they wanted me to do. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's great that that idea that you became really adaptable and you decide it's not unlike what a lot of people say, you know, well, once like you how learn, you once you learn how to do something, you have a model. Mm -hmm. So once I learned how to play the dobro, which I learned as an adult from scratch, that became my model for like, oh, well, I learned how to do this. How did I learn how to do that? So when I was trying to learn how to be a commercial composer, it was like, there was the composing part, but there was also the tech part. Like it was like learning all the gear and learning how to use audio software and learning how to use microphones and like all this other sort of stuff. And, but like once I had a model for it, like then when I wanted to be, when I wanted to teach online, it's like, well, if I learned how to record music, like surely I can learn how to like stream a video, you know? So, I mean, it just becomes this series of things like, like, you know, your knowledge and your confidence is kind of cumulative and that works stylistically too. And so you learn how to play in one style. You're like, well, okay, I figured out how to take like that era of blues apart. Well, what makes this era of honky tonk go, you know? And, you know, then that, then you just sort of, I always tell people when they're trying to learn like a new style, I'm like, okay, this first song, it's going to be like pulling teeth. Like it's really hard to get because finger style, it's all this coordination, right? It's all this like new left hand grips and new right hand stuff and, you know, calluses and all this stuff. I'm like, but the second song will take you half as long because all the things you're learning in the first song, half of them will apply to the next song. And then the next one will go faster because you'll already know the chords, you'll already know this part, you'll, and then it's like just sort of figuring out how to apply that to the next song. And so it goes, it gets easier and easier to learn within a particular thing. And then you start something new and you're like, here we go again, we got to start and learn all the bits. And then the next time, like those things apply and those things apply and, you know, so it goes. But if you learn how to do things you don't like, then you're just kind of stuck. Like I never did wedding gigs in New York because mm -hmm. it was super lucrative, but everybody I knew hated doing wedding gigs. So I was like, oh, I don't really feel incentivized around this. You know, it's like everybody hates doing this. So I think I won't learn how to be, because I would have, there's a lot to know to be a good wedding musician. You got to know a lot of stuff. And I'm like, mm, I don't think I'm going to learn that stuff because nobody likes doing this. So, Well, I, as I hand it over to Cheryl, um, I'm just going to say for the record that as matter of fact as you are about all these things, like one of the really fun parts of kind of like, 
like following you to a couple different towns and places was that like you're very matter of fact like oh yeah i just thought well how hard can that be i'll do it and then we would have conversations like your friends would be like do you hear what he's doing like like do you hear what he's doing in those arrangements those bass like that's so hard that's so crazy and and now he's writing this movie music and it's really beautiful and that's how do you learn how to do that and you would just be like oh i just thought it'd be fun to learn how to do that and you would do it so it's a deep thing you know that you know and if you can make it a normal thing in your life, then, then that makes um, learning hard things easier, but it doesn't mean that they're just simple because you like them um, for everyone who's listening. I, I think it's fun to hear you talk about all these things that you've done that are actually really hard to do each single one of them. Um, well, some writer I was reading recently has this expression, he says simple, but not easy. Right. right? There you go. So it's yeah. not, it's not a complicated idea to learn new stuff, but it's not easy necessarily it's just you know but you're way more motivated when you're excited about something i mean all these things that i've done i was like really excited about like i couldn't wait to be good enough to play the dobro with people and i couldn't wait to be good enough to like be able to write a film cue in four hours you know i was just like man that's going to be so fun you know and and that's the thing it's like and, and all the stuff that i do like when i play finger style guitar like i didn't even take playing the guitar like that seriously for, for decades. I was just like, that's just something I do when I'm sitting around. And the different things, like the weird, the, whatever, the bass lines and the voicings, it's like, they were really just like, well, could you do that at the same time as you do this? Mm -hmm. And and it, and it would, no, not at first. Like, but like, what would it, you know? And it's just like, it's just this like slow accumulation of stuff. But the thing about music is, if you like music, you're, you're usually pretty excited. And the thing is like, when I was studying jazz in college, like I wasn't excited about it. I just was like, well, I think I like this, but I liked listening to jazz, but I didn't like practicing it. And it was really hard to admit at a certain point that I didn't like working on it. Cause that meant I wasn't gonna get great at it. And I was really kind of disappointed. And I was like, well, but I'm like these other things I just do for fun already. Like I never like, I never tried to learn slide guitar. I just learned it because it was cool and I wanted to know how. But, you know, it was really hard to try to learn how to play West Montgomery solos, like really fucking hard. And I didn't enjoy it the same way. So I think to some extent you got to follow your nose, you know. And the thing is, that we unfortunately, we have this kind of hierarchy that certain things are harder or better than are better than others because they're harder. Like you were saying at the very beginning, like we have this idea that if it's not jazz or it's not classical, it's not as hard or there's not as much to it. And it's like the world has when I realized that there were like 150 guys lined up at the West Montgomery door who had gotten there before me, that I was going to be like the 151st billionth person who wanted to play like that. Even eventually like with film scoring, I was like, there are 150 billion guys who have been trying to be like John Williams since they were 13. I don't have a shot, you know? I mean, if you really wanted to, like that would be the thing. But to me, I reached a point where I was like, I'm already good at these other things and I really love them. So why am I banging my head against the wall trying to, you know, be mediocre at this other thing? So, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I mean, and the other, because because in the end, when you're 20, you have time to try everything. When you're in your 50s, you're like, I think I need to focus a little bit and be like, hmm, if I do this, I could probably get even better at it. But I don't want to maybe, uh, I sound like I'm, I mean, I'm still interested in learning stuff for sure. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there is a point where like, it's just, it's, just a, it's, it's back to art and artisan. It's like specialization, generalization, you know, which one you're going to do. And I think you got to be a generalist first. Right. I mean, that's how they make you do med school. You got to do everything. You're like, I'm not going to be a shrink. They're like, I don't care. Go to the psych ward this week. You know, like they make you learn about everything. And that's kind of what you guys have to do at Berkeley. Right. It's like you got to learn something about everything. And then you can choose and be like, well, this is where I'm going. Hey, Cheryl, what's on your mind? Yeah. Yeah. Mind? I mean, there's, there's a lot of stuff there. Up. What's that? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there. And um, well, yeah, I mean, that's uh, the thought simple ain't easy. And that means on a lot of levels, people see you do something and you and because you're, you do it all the time, it looks easy. But they don't know, they don't know all the little parts in there. Um, 
and ultimately, you know, when you get to that point, I think that's when you really have mastery, when you do something and you can communicate to people that maybe don't know about the music that you play and they they get it and they go out wow, that, you know, because it's really you're at that point of mastery where it's just kind of flowing out of you. But you did all that study. And I, I think that's, you know, I'm just thinking about what you're talking about, about, you know, you have to be curious for one thing um, and then learning how to practice, I think is a big thing. And I, that's a, one of my favorite topics. I always talk to people, how do you practice? What do you practice? What's your, you know, and even my students like, what did you warm up today? What did you show me what it is? I'd like to know some, I'm always looking for new things. And when you get to that point where you can really organize your practice time, you'll get the most out of it. Um, and that may, maybe means a lot of times you're spending time on things you're not good at, which can be hard, right? Because you're like, yeah, man, but I, I play great when I put Stevie Ray Vaughan on and I jam along. And that's great. And you need that, but that's not helping you, you know, learn, get a, be a better reader or be a better at this or this, that skill. Um, if you don't actually go there and look at that thing that's uncomfortable. And I, and I always think this too, just about arts education in general. And I mean, the bigger thing about, uh, you know, for all ages, um, it really does teach you how to break down a problem into smaller bits. And like, okay, well, if I'm going to approach this, this melody is, it's just a major scale. Okay. You know, there's a fragment. Of, okay. Let me work on that. And, and I think when you are involved in arts education on any level, whether it's to be professional or just because you love it and you're curious about it, you know, because sometimes older people are saying, I'm too old to do this. I'm like, come on, you love it. You want, you've wanted to do this is that it does engage your pro it engages your process of how to break something down to the simplest thing. And I, and I do also think that can be the hard thing in a difficult thing in a higher education thing, because you have a lot of things and how do you just start to work on the small fundamental things. And I, I would say for myself, I remember there was one point definitely when I was at Berkeley, I realized there's no way I'm going to be able to play all these things that I'm learning. So I just became a really uh, very good note taker of things and made these notebooks. And then, you know, later on when you're ready, oh, wow, well, there's that thing. And I know it's in that notebook. You can go back to it. Um, and I think that is the struggle is like, how do you use your time effectively? And, you know, is it serving your your musical goals and and is it time for it too sometimes you have to know that time when it's like okay i'm gonna i'm gonna get to this later so anyway it seems like you've really worked mastered that so i mean in that sense of saying when you were younger you didn't know how to practice but you had that one saxophone teacher that really taught you more about how to practice the how to do the thing how to do the small things so that you can make progress on the on the bigger picture yeah i mean this idea that he had of like this is how you know your instrument was really useful and i didn't go and try to play every this is the other thing it's like we're talking about certain styles are one of the big differences between studying jazz or classical music and studying um for lack of a better catch-all like roots music is that i didn't learn to play the dobro in 12 keys it's just, it's not relevant, you know? It's like, I learned to play it in two major keys and a couple of minor keys. And like, that's what I, you know, like I didn't go and try to like play all like up the neck with like this one bar and this crazy tuning. And because that's, I mean, Bill Barron had us play everything. You know, you got to play it in all 12 keys. That's what you do to play bebop. But for the dobro, like you don't. And, but it was like, not worrying about that and getting as good as possible in this one area. But I mean, but yeah, I mean, having someone just, I mean, being able to adapt the values to like the situation without using it as an excuse to, like you say, not confront difficult things. It's like within that, there were still difficult things and I still needed to be able to play more in more than one key with more chords or whatever, but just, it was a different landscape, you know, but yeah, I mean, and, you know, when I was trying to be a composer, like one of the things was, was like I had never really understood how to do orchestral writing or how to, I mean, I could fake it, but I didn't know like 
you know, I had taken harmony and counterpoint in college, but it just, you know, I didn't understand. I tried really hard, but I didn't get it. So I went back and like started trying to learn how to write, you know, write a corral, write counterpoint, do all that stuff. By the time I got any kind of traction with it, I was already kind of out of that world, but I kept working on it because it was just interesting. You know, it was just fun to learn about. And that still kind of informed like what I learned from studying that kind of informed my teaching, kind of informed my guitar playing, kind of informed my musicality generally, because you learn these sort of musical things and it opens your ears and you listen differently and you know, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So Ben, you get the last question of the coffee pot today. Hmm. Um, and it's a question that Ben always asks um, and uh, everybody's been waiting for it. So go ahead, Ben. So what's the question that you think students should be asking that they're not thinking of asking? Asking themselves or asking one of their teachers? I guess either or, yeah. Just... <laughs> Going through the Rolodex of all the things they could be asking, you know. And kids, you can email me later and ask what a Rolodex is. Um, I think they should be asking themselves what they should be asking. What do I really want to be doing? What do I really actually think would be cool to do? What do I think is worthwhile doing? Not, you know, what my friends are woodshedding or even, I hate to say it, what my teachers are telling me I should be working on, but like what, like, what should, what do I really want to be able to do? But that's yeah. like, it's completely personal. And, you know, and I say this because when I was in grad school, like I had teachers who would only talk about the second class of quintet and Herbie, Ron and Tony. And I was just like, I, I like the modern jazz quartet and early Duke Ellington and Horace Silver. And I don't think I really care about Herbie, Ron and Tony, even if you do. And so I think really what I'm saying is it's the job of an institution to give you a, a, a grounding and an education. And there are certain general things everybody needs to know, and that is undisputable. But what you're going to apply it to is your business. And I think it, you need to, when I say, what do you want to do? I'm like, make your own canon. Like, what are your, who are your favorite musicians? What are your favorite records? What is it that makes you want to play music? And can you, can you generalize from what you like, what it is about that? Like, when I figured out that my favorite musicians did something that didn't exist before they existed, that's when I realized, like, that's what I like about them. And whether I can have any hope of getting there myself, I would like to be a person like that, you mm -hmm. know? So for me, my canon includes among other, well, like, you know, certainly people like Duke Ellington and the Modern Jazz Quartet. Those are guys who, Duke Ellington's not known for being able to play the changes. He's known as being a, this gorgeous orchestrator. The, John Lewis is not known for being able to like play bebop, even though he could, um, you know, he was a composer and he wrote these incredible songs and orchestrated for this this quartet. You know, Ry Cooter, nobody played slide guitar like Ry Cooter before he showed up. Nobody played rhythm guitar like Ry Cooter before he showed up. Nobody played song, nobody wrote songs like Mose Allison before Mose Allison showed up, you know? And if you go through your personal favorites, you will hopefully figure out what it is about them that like when you put all those people in a room, what is the essence of what's there to you? And that probably will inform what it is you want to do with your own music. And it is ultimately in the, at the end of the day, your music and your choices, because you're going to take all this stuff and you're going to be a filter that's going to, you know, do this thing. And if you, the point of learning the point of learning the skills is so that you can be a filter and not so that you can play exactly. You learn to play like someone else, not to play like someone else. You learn to play like someone else so that you have that inside you and you can filter it through you and you can combine it with the other things that you love. And then you can make this thing 
that is this like alchemical mix of all the things that you care about. And so whenever someone gives you something that says like, I mean, I tried to listen to Herbie, Ron and Tony and on some level, like 30 years later, it made a tiny bit of sense. When I went through a bunch of other stuff and finally got back to that, I was like, okay, now that I've listened to all the stuff that those guys were listening to, I sort of understand why it was important for them to do this and not do the other thing that they could have kept doing, you know? But the point is like, as a musician, and you know, you're still at the end of the day, a human being who plays music and not the other way around. And so everybody learns in like kindergarten, like you're individual, like you're your own person. You are, there's nobody else like you. And like on some level that's true. So you got to like take all this stuff in and still somehow hold on to yourself and be like, what am I going to do with this stuff so that it's me? And when you get to do that in the process, like it's, it's not like you graduate to a point where you get to just get to like, say like, screw everything else. I'm just doing this. You're going to keep taking stuff in your whole life, ideally, but you do get to decide. And I just, I'm only saying this because like, it didn't occur to me for a really long time that it was up to me to decide what kind of musician to be. You know, because there's so much pressure to get good at all these different things. But the goal of getting good at things is so you can do something with it. Yeah. I think that's a good thought to end on for today. Like everybody go practice and uh, <laughs> and and soak up everything you can from your teachers and from from the lineage of musicians that you can listen to on records and um and then find your own way with it that's a it's a tall order it's a tall order for a week but um but it's a good thing to start on um and so i just want to say thank you thanks cheryl um thanks for being here um thanks ben and david hamburger thank you for sharing all this stuff with us today this was great and um so we're gonna keep hanging out everybody um but we'll be with you all on the next coffee talk